Maiden Voyage presents Guinevere of Camelot, adapted from Mallory's Mort d'Artour. Your host is Millard Cradleville. Ladies and gentlemen, we present at this time the second in a series of dramatic readings of Guinevere of Camelot. And we go back to the time of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. In our reading last week, you recall that Guinevere said that she was willing to marry King Arthur out of a feeling of duty, but she also said that she could not guarantee that she would love her husband. Her heart, she said, was like a bird loosed from a cage, and she could not guarantee where it would light. It might land upon Arthur, but also, she said, it might alight upon some lesser person of the realm. As we read tonight, we discover Guinevere for the first time alone with King Arthur, her husband, and shortly thereafter, we see her meet with Lancelot, the greatest of all the knights, the man who is shortly to become her lover. Let us turn now to our reading of Guinevere of Camelot. Then was the high feast made ready, and the king was wedded unto Guinevere, and both were crowned with great solemnity. Arthur and Guinevere, caught up in preparations for the great event, had scarce a time for greeting till the ceremonies all were passed. And even then the king and his new queen must needs preside at banquet in the hall for all the knights and nobles of the realm. At last, King Arthur drew his wife aside, away from all the merrymaking throng of knights and ladies to a quiet place. My Lady Guinevere, come rest a while. The ceremonies must have tired you. Nay, my lord, the splendor of the day enchants me. I could dance and sing for joy. So many gallant knights, my heart's a whirl with gallantries and compliments. And one, Sir Lancelot, did speak with me most fair while you held converse with your other guests. Aye, Lancelot, in ways of courtesy, excels the best. His prowess in the field of battle also wins him much regard. So I have learned. Indeed, the day bodes fair. In one thing only have I some regret. Then tell me, let me make it right. I fear that as a courting swain I've been remiss, speaking through others' tongues. I should have come to woo my bride myself. But, as you know, my kingdom stands on battles I have won and battles yet to win. My crown and yours unsteady still and new. If I had left my throne unguarded, all that I had gained I might have lost. So Merlin counseled me, and he is wise. And did I trust speak fair to you and to your father? Tell me then, what thing you lack to make your joy complete? I understand, my lord, yet now that we are wed, some quiet conference with you would please my heart. I scarcely know you, sire, as other than my king. There's remedy for that. Though I've been twice crowned a king, I am a man with faults and virtues both embattled in my soul. There is no war between us. Let your faults lie quiet, sir, for I would know your virtues. These you'll find as chance may have it, for I cannot speak praise of myself. There is no need to speak. Aye, lady, there is need. Oh, Guinevere, Guinevere, I'm your husband now with all my flaws, which you must learn from me and not abroad. I hope that you will love me, and I know that love can only live when rumor's breath is stilled. I might have claimed that as a king I take no blame, that you should wink your eye at evils I have done. But I would win your favor now that I've won your hand. Until you know me as I am, my love, you cannot weigh the good against the bad and true and honest judgment of my worth. Let me f confess to you to ease my heart. If you are so inclined, but Know you now that I do not and I shall not require of you the secrets of your inner heart. Some things there are too private to be known. There is nothing in my heart that you may not know. You are my wife. Though I've loved before, I love you now and will forever hence. 
But you must know that I have sired a son who's here at court and is one of my knights. My well, lord, you need not. Let me finish, love. You will hear of my great sin, but from me. Mordred, whom you have met today, the child of my own sister, is my only son. Your sister, sire? I, Guinevere. It was Margaz, the gentle wife of good King Lot, whose other son, Gawain, is my great joy. You call me, sire? Where are you hiding, rogue? By the saints, if I but think your name, I find you near. Then pardon, I intrude. Stay, stay, Gawain, you're welcome here. In truth, I came this way to seek you, sire, and greet your queen. My lady, you are missed. Shagwa's hands are slow, the minstrel's tunes are sad and somber when your laughter leaves. Return her to the feast, my lord, before your boisterous knights play havoc in the hall. I thank you, Sir Gawain, you speak most fair. And fairly chide me. We'll return at once. For soon the sword play, honoring the queen which I commanded, as fitting sport to finish out the day will be commenced. It may begin before you give the sign if you delay. Your knights are restless now and crave the gentle presence of their queen. Even noble Lancelot is prowling round and round and gloomy as a bear. Gloomy, the courtly Lancelot. He seemed so gentle and so pleasant when we spoke together at the feast. Why, he beguiled my ear with many merry tales. My queen, let us in haste depart. Gawain will have the kingdom tottering if we but let his eager tongue run on. And do not fear for Lancelot. He's mild as April's wind until he fights. Before you go a word, I crave a boon of you, my lord and king, on this your wedding day. Make me a knight, a fellow of the table round. Gawain, you could have asked for nothing I could give more welcome to my heart. In you, I see the knight I might have been if fate had not chose to make me king. On this most joyful day, before the sun is set, you'll have your boon. Now come, my lady wife, we stay too long. I heed your counsel, knight, and take the queen back to the guests. I'll follow later, sire. I see my brother beckons me to stay. Well, Mordred, are you ready for the fight? Why should I play at war when Lancelot will doubtless win the prize? With swords afoot I am unskilled. Give me a horse. <laughs> Lancelot afoot would split your skull. You need not jeer. For I have other ways to bring such proud and warlike dogs to heel. But enough of this. What think you of the queen? Oh, she shines like the summer sun in wintertime. And I must go to polish up my sword that it may catch the flashing of her laugh and blind the night which I may encounter. And get you gone. She'll surely smile on you, on Lancelot, and all the favored ones. On me, I think not. I am Arthur's son, but I might be a low-born knave for all the honor that I get. My face is harsh. I have no skill in jousting. Only hope is Arthur's heir to sometime rule the land. This Guinevere could throw my plans awry if she should bear a son. Yet she is fair. My father chooses well. Does she love him? It's too soon to know, but I will watch and bide my time, perhaps. But no, not I. Some bolder knight, a hearty fighter, would win her favor if she scorns the king. And well she may, her eye has roving lights. Who comes? Not Lancelot. By faith it is, with him, and he without a sword. How I should love to see him miss the fight and lose the prize. He has not seen me. Good. And I'll away. I had it in the hall. Laid it aside to join the dancing. And now it's gone. 
queen will surely think me rough and rude if I avoid this fight that honors her. My lord, Sir Lancelot. My lady queen. I overheard you speak. Your sword is lost. It is, my lady. And I shall be shamed, for he who lacks a sword lacks means to fight. I was a careless lot to lay it by and leave it so untended. Do not fear. The squire who tended me, making meet the hall, did move aside a sword so fine, so long, and with such battle marks upon the sheath, that well I knew it could belong to none but you. And where does it lie now? Tell me, my queen, that I may seek it out. Nay, Lancelot, you need not search so far. I have it here, lapped in my train, all hid from envious eyes. I kept it safe, knowing whatever knight had lost it would not wish the rest to know, and mock at him for his unwitting loss. So they would do. And so from this time on, my sword shall never leave my waking sight, my queen. For this, your careful, kind concern, I vow that I shall be your own true knight until my death. And from this moment on, such worship as I win will honor you. And if through some unhappy chance you need a champion unto your own defense, I swear by this my sword that I shall throw my life at battle's hazard in your cause. This little service I have done, Sir Knight, deserves less thanks than you have given me. And yet I would not that you were forsworn, for any woman would be glad and proud to claim you as her faithful champion. And I shall need a warrior to defend my name in honor's cause. For well you know my lord King Arthur may not fight for me, but must needs stand aside to be the judge in such affairs with calm and passive eye. My lady, you are newly made a queen. How do you know these customs of the court? Merlin advised me when he sought my hand for Arthur. Queens, according to the sage, cannot live simply. Duties and delights each have their hours. But duty stands ahead and claims attention ere delight be sought. And if you live by this, my lady queen, your reign and Arthur shall outshine the ages. Wise counselings are wasted on weak minds. And if I have the strength to be a queen, I do not know, for I am yet untried. You have the heart, my queen. Do not fear. This you have proved to me. And if you, you care for all your subjects equals that for me, you cannot help but win their good regard. Lancelot, with you to tilt your lance in my behalf, I need no other friend. My queen, you must not speak such thoughts alive. Your strength is in your subjects. Not in you. No. I am your subject lady. You, my queen. Two crowns there are between us, Lancelot. But we have tarried long, for you must fight, and I must join my lord to watch the fray. Farewell, my queen. For you I'll win the prize. Pray do. And now, my faithful knight, farewell. and consultant for this evening has been Professor M. R. Cradiville of the Department of English and Speech at Iowa State College. Readers were Frank Aluso as Arthur, Ricky Weiser as Guinevere, Don Peterson as Gawain, Ralph Bork as Mordred, Den Johnson as Lancelot.